Amen and amen. Woo! Was that worship or what? Now, you know, we, we get to see the, the front line, and they're just beautiful, and their voices are awesome. But we don't see this fella walking in the back there. The drummer. Thank you. Woo! Yes. Boy, it is good to be in the house of the Lord, is it not? And it's good to see the house full. Amen? Woo! It's good. Rubbing shoulders with saints. That's kind of a cool thing. Yes? If we were out in the park, we'd just kind of be slipping by each other because we'd all be perspiring, right? Yeah. So it's nice that we can come inside. And it's nice that we have one service to have more people together. I was talking earlier uh, to a couple in the back over on this corner over here, and, and they said, boy, we're going we're gonna to see people that we haven't seen. And isn't that way cool? It's difficult. One, it's neat that we can have three services. It's neat that we can have the 6 o'clock on Saturday night and, and uh, usually the 9 o'clock and then the 11 o'clock, but it kind of isolates us, doesn't it? We, we don't get to see the body like this together, so these kinds of times are just awesome. It's really good. I wanted to let you know that uh, my watch broke. So, uh, and my eyes are so bad I really can't read the <laughs> clock in the back, Jim. So, <laughs> so if you're watching from home, would you just call in to Jim and let him know that, that we're running a little bit longer? Uh, so I just wanted to, to put that out there in the beginning. You know, it's a amazing thing how God takes his word, his word, and divides it amongst a body like this. Because this young man over here will probably receive a different word from the truth of God's word than this young man in the white shirt over here. And God will be speaking through the Holy Spirit to all of us from the same verse, from the same word. The miracle of God and how he touches us and how that particular verse, how that particular thought impacts us because we have a need. Maybe we're going to use it to heal. Maybe, we, maybe we're going to use it to encourage that we were looking for just the right phrase, just the right thought to share with somebody later this afternoon. So God is going to take that holy word and he's going to multiply it and use it by whatever number we have in here and however many people are blessed to watch us from their living room. Let's pray together before I start asking God to take this word and to plug it into our life today, challenging each of us that perhaps we might be a little different, not because it's a weird pastor up here talking today, <laughs> but it might be a little different because God touched us today. So pray for that in your life, and pray for me as we share that word together. Let's bow before him.
Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for what Paul has told us as he has explained the mystery of the ages that Christ is in us, the hope of glory. And Father, this day, as we collectively here this morning sit and read your word, we pray that that word, that truth, will impact us personally. Not just the time that we camp out here for a half hour, 45 minutes listening, but that it impacts us as we leave and as we walk into the world. We thank you for that miracle. We thank you for you in our life. And it's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. And the people said? Amen. Amen. We're going to talk today um, about a condition that we have. Not that we go to see uh, Dr. Do right with, but a condition that we have inside of us. The inability to be part of God's family without God doing something for us. We're going we're gonna to look at something Paul gives us in Romans chapter 5, and we're going to read a few verses there in a little bit. And then we're going to flip back into the Old Testament where it really gets dusty, and when you open it up, things fly out, and it, it's just really scary back there. We're going to look at, at uh, Samuel, the book of Samuel, and we're going to pick up on a, a guy in that uh, old book that uh, understood what adoption was about, understood that he was helpless, that he had no way of helping himself, but that somebody came along in his life and called him son. As I was getting ready for uh, sharing with you guys, I, I came across, a, I read in a periodical a, a description of adoption, and, and I thought it was pretty good, so I want to share it with you. It was uh, given to me, or it was in the article by a fella, he was a family therapist, his name was Paul Faulkner, and I don't know why I'm looking at it with these glasses because I can't see up close with those, so we'll switch over to my grandpa glasses. Well, that's a lot better. <laughs> I used to have bifocals in those glasses, but I took them out, and so we had to change over. So Paul Faulkner tells of the man who was set out to adopt a troubled teenage girl. One would question the father's logic, Paul said. The girl was destructive, disobedient, and dishonest. One day, she came home from school and ransacked the house looking for money. By the time he arrived, she was gone and the house was in shambles. Upon hearing of her actions, his friends, several of his friends, urged him not to finalize the adoption papers. They said, let her go. She has a problem. They said, let her go. After all, she's really not your daughter. His response was simple. He said, yes, I know, but I told her she was. And that's what's happening is a picture of the fellow that we're going to look at back in the book of Samuel. There's, Paul describes for us in Romans 
chapter 5, a condition that we have, and he points out five different factors of what we are when we are separated from God. And so chapter 5, verse 6, says this, For while we were still helpless, while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly, the hopeless. So in verse 6, we are helpless, we are ungodly, and we are hopeless. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But verse 8, we discover a little bit about the love of God. It says, but God, but God demonstrated his own love, God's love, the same one that created heaven and earth, the same God that breathed out of his mouth light and created everything that we see. That God, the God, demonstrated his own love towards us, towards the ungodly, the hopeless, towards the helpless. He demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, while we were yet separated from him, while we were yet not adopted, when we were stealing from the cookie jar, when we were ransacking the house, when we were making everything he stands for a sham, when we were doing all of that, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, his blood, Christ's blood, Jesus' blood, we shall be saved from, and here's another descriptive word, the wrath of God. We'll be saved from the judgment. We'll be saved from the punishment of that life unyielding to God. We'll be saved from the wrath of God through him, capital H, Jesus, through him. For if while we were enemies, the fifth word that Paul uses to describe us in our hopelessness and our helplessness, he calls us enemies against God, fighting against God, pushing away from God. Paul calls us enemies. We were reconciled to God even then, Through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. His life. Jesus' life. So Paul gives us a picture in Romans that is not very pretty in one respect. It tells us what we really are when we take off the really nice shirt and we take off the really beautiful dress and we take off all the makeup and, well, some makeup. And it shows us what we are without him. And the interesting thing is is we have no power (laughs) and we don't have enough money to buy our way into a relationship with him. We are helpless. We have no way of developing a relationship with God, the God, outside of what Jesus Christ has done for us when we accept him as our personal Savior. Now, I don't know if if anyone sitting here is in that camp, not knowing Jesus as your personal Savior, Today would be a good day to talk to someone about that. Ask the question. There's people that would love to talk to you about Jesus. And then we flip back to the Old Testament. So we have a picture of helplessness. We have a picture of hopelessness outside of God outside of someone, outside of us doing something for us. 
And back <clears throat> in the Old Testament, we, we come across a, a fella back in 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4, that uh, kind of gives us a picture. And we get introduced to a fella. And I want to read that verse. It says, now Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son <coughs> crippled in his feet. He was five years old when the report of Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it happened that in her hurry to flee, he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. We don't get a lot in verse 4, but we do get three things. We get Mephibosheth's name, and it's okay if you don't say that right. You might say Mephibosheth who? Mephibosheth. We get his name. We hear of his calamity. He was dropped and it broke both of his feet and he was deformed for the rest of his life. And then we get his deformity. He was crippled for life. The son of Jonathan, a little backstory. Back in those days when a king was killed and a new king would come into power in the land, usually the new king would kill everybody related to the old king's family. So Mephibosheth, they were fearful, would be killed by the new king. So that was the reason the nurse grabs Mephibosheth and takes off and wants to hide him and to get away so that he can be preserved and he can be safe. And in that she dropped him, five years old. We don't know all of the story. We only know that she dropped him. Maybe she fell on top of him to compound the problem. I, I don't know. But he is crippled from then on. And he picks up a label from then on. And the label is, he's crippled. Now we need to find out <clears throat> a little bit about Jonathan. And we need to understand the relationship of Jonathan and David. They had a unique relationship, one that was unlike any other relationship in the Old Testament. These two guys were together. They bonded. They were besties. They couldn't get any closer. It's actually recorded in 1 Samuel that they loved each other. That's a pretty precious thing. Gals, I, I, I think it might be a little easier for y'all to have that close, close, close relationship with another gal where you just bond, where you share everything, where you actually, in a sense, love each other. But for guys, it doesn't happen a lot. And it happened with Jonathan and with David. And I, I want to pick up on this because it's important that we get this understanding. Back in 1 Samuel chapter 20, we pick up on the story a little bit, verses 14, 15, 16, and 17. 
And it says, if I am still alive, you will not show me the loving, will you not show me the loving kindness of the Lord that I may not die? You shall not cut off your loving kindness from my house forever, not even when the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, with David, saying, may the Lord require it at the hand of David's enemy. Jonathan made David vow again because of his love for him, because he loved him as he loved his own self. Flipping back just a little bit further <clears throat> in verse or chapter 20, David was being sought after to be killed by Saul, by Saul, Jonathan's dad, and so they devised a plan so that they could inform, Jonathan could inform David if in fact he was gonna be after him to kill him, and then David was gonna flee. So later in the chapter, the plan unfolds, and David finds out that Saul indeed is going to kill him. So he takes off, and Saul, shares this. When the lad was gone, part of the plan, David rose from the south side and fell on his face to the ground and bowed three times. David to Jonathan. David to Jonathan. He bowed three times and they kissed each other and wept together. But David wept more. Jonathan said to David, go in safety, inasmuch as we have sworn to each other in the name of the Lord, a vow before God, and here they go repeating it, saying, the Lord will be between me and you and between my descendants and your descendants. For a week or two. No? It says forever. <laughs> yeah, right. Then he rose and departed while Jonathan went back to the city. This is the last recording that we have of David and Jonathan together. It's the last time in the scripture that they were face to face with each other. So the story goes on and David becomes king, as we know, becomes king of Judah and becomes king of Israel, king of the Jews. And he sets up his kingdom and he is a successful king. He is a power king. In the backdrop is Mephibosheth, still in hiding. He's in a lonely little place, we'll find out here in just a minute. And he was helpless, much like the story we read from Paul's description of helplessness, of hopelessness. Not only is he helpless, not only is he living in a faraway place, <laughs> but he's crippled. Back in that time, it was a real strike to be crippled as the male because you were unable to take care, you were unable to provide you were unable to be productive. So it was a blow to Mephibosheth. He was helpless. He did not know of the covenant that was made between his dad and the king, David. So we're going to read in... in 
chapter 9 of 2 Samuel, uh, a story of, of how this comes back together. But, you know, when, when we read Scripture, we only have a few verses. In fact, it's just one chapter, 13 verses, that talks about this adoption and reunion. And so this story is kind of like looking through a knot hole in a fence at a whole scene in a city block. You just don't see all of it. So David is in the palace. He's in his home. He's wondering. He's sitting there. He's thinking. And maybe, maybe it flashes back on him. My buddy, I wonder, we made an oath. We made a vow before God. We we don't know what was in David's mind. All we know is what Samuel records for us, and that unfolds here in chapter 9. So we're going to pick up on it a little bit, if I'm able to read it. (laughs) Then David said, is there yet anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? So there was something going on inside of David, inside of his heart. He was being pricked with that oath for Jonathan's sake. Now there was a servant of the house of Saul that was in the town whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David. They went and got him. Somebody went out from David's palace and got Ziba, the servant of Saul, and said, hey, king wants to see you. David asked him, are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. The king said, is there not yet anyone of the house? And verse 3 is kind of important, and we're going to talk about it for a second here. The king said, is there not yet anyone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is crippled in both feet. The tag, this is almost 20 years later that this is unfolding from when David and Jonathan last had contact. 20 years and a lot happened between here and here. So we get verse 3. Samuel gives us verse 3. Just think. Here's the king saying, well, I want to do something. You know, I, I need to, I, I want to help here. And so he says, is there anybody left? And this Ziba guy is called and, and he says, yeah, yep. There's a son left. <laughs> a son left but he is crippled. I wonder, (laughs) it's just Doug, I wonder if David said, wow, I wonder if there might be somebody else left. This guy's crippled. (laughs) Not going to fit in the palace real well. I, I wonder if there was a thought. Another thing that I wonder when I read verses like verse 3 is why do we always put a tag on somebody? <laughs> what, why, why do we do that? What, why do we list a thing? And, and here's what I mean. Have you heard about John? You know, the guy that got divorced? Or... I got a letter 
from Jerry. You remember him, the alcoholic. Sharon is back in town. What a shame Sharon has to raise her two kids by herself. I saw Melissa today. I don't know why she can't hold a job. I wonder why we do that. And on the flip side of that, on the flip side of that, isn't it hard when they say your name, Doug Fisher, and tag me with what used to be, with what I did, that he's divorced? Isn't it hard to receive that? Isn't there anyone that can see me for me? That yes, I did that, but I'm not the same as I was there. This is 20 years later. Mephibosheth is now 25. And the label still is put on him. So the king said, and it's also interesting. So the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, behold, he is in the house of Machar, the son of Amiel, in a place called Lodabar. It was a backwater town. It was a backwater place. It was a no-name city. Could have been Drain, Oregon. <laughs> Could have been. <laughs> I'm sorry, if you're from Drain, it's, I'm sure it's a great place. <laughs> I just passed it on the freeway. I was up in Eugene this week helping my daughter pack as she's moving uh, back down to the valley. Um, and so I passed it twice, and, and it's a name that just kind of sticks with you. <laughs> the king David sent and brought him from the house of Machar, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan. Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, fell on his face, and prostrated himself. You remember David did that to Jonathan back in the field when he got the word 20 years ago that he was being hunted by Jonathan's dad, Saul. To kill him. And as they were ready to part, David fell on the ground in front of Jonathan, his best buddy. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he said, Here is your servant. Let's stop there just for a second. Mephibosheth for 20 years has been in Lodabar, in the backwaters, out of public sight. No mention of him until the second book of Samuel. He's been picked up by the king's army. <laughs> the king, the guy in charge, the big guy sends out some cohorts and they pick him up and they bring him to the palace. Think of that. I think he may have been wondering, was this the day I'm dying? I'm going to go see the king. There is somebody that I don't know that I have been 
running from for a long time, and I don't know what's going to happen. Here is your servant as he's face down on the floor. David said to him, and these are precious words, do not fear. You remember that phrase? We should. It's in the New Testament a lot. In fact, it was the most frequent words to come out of Jesus' mouth, fear not, don't be afraid. That's kind of hard to do when you're without hope and you don't have a lot going for you. When you're outside of God, not in the family, not an adopted son or daughter, and I'm sure here today that we have some fear. It's amazing in the counseling offices, not only at Table Rock, but across our city, how many people come and talk because they're afraid of what is happening in their life. Jesus gave actually the command. It wasn't a suggestion. It wasn't, hey, this might be a good idea. Try it on, see if it fits. It was actually a command given by Jesus, the most frequent words recorded in the New Testament from one man, Jesus, fear not. Do not be afraid. And so Mephibosheth hears from King David, who is about to do what Dr. Faulkner talked about earlier, he was going to call him a son. <laughs> Just one other little tidbit, if you're into tidbits. <laughs> I had a lady come up to me last night, and she says, thank you, I, I, I love these kinds of facts, and she was writing it down. Do not fear is in every book of the entire Bible. It's a big deal to not fear because of what it does to us and where it causes us to live or where we think we are in the pecking order. It's a heartache to see what fear does to you. I know I have been fearful. There are times now that Doug Fisher is fearful. And it takes you from the A game to the Z game. It takes you from service, from being what you were called to be, <laughs> to out of service. Are we to be light? <laughs> Are we to be salt? Are we to be used? I think so. But it takes us from here to here, and it doesn't take very long to get here. Don't be fearful, for I will surely show kindness to you for the sake of your father, Jonathan. The vow, 20 years ago, for the sake of your father, Jonathan, and will restore to you all the land of your grandfather, Saul. That was no small deal. Saul had a lot. He was the king. And everything that Saul had, 
David was going to relinquish because it was his and give to Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth. Fulfill the vow. And you, listen to this, guys. Here comes the adoption. And you will eat at my table regularly. <laughs> Get the picture, guys. Here we are, living in drain. We get a call from Washington, D.C., from the head guy. We get on a plane, and we head back to Washington, fearful. And the guy at the top, just like the story in Romans 8, God, the guy at the top, wants to adopt us. And he wants us to eat at his table regularly. <laughs> Mercy. God that breathed out light at 186,000 miles per second. We turned the lights on off in here and turned them back on. You couldn't tell when they come on. It's, that, it's 186,000 miles per second is the speed of light, and God spoke light. That God, that guy says, I want you to eat at my table. <laughs> That's an awesome thing. That's an awesome thing to be called a daughter and a son of the king, God. But that's what's unfolding here for crippled Mephibosheth. And then it goes on and it talks a little more about what that's going to look like and who's going to take care of whom. Verse 11 says, Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king commands, his servant, so your servant will do. So Mephibosheth ate, catch this, ate at David's table as one of the king's nephews. No, Mephibosheth ate at the king's table as one of David's sons. <laughs> Catch the scene. Catch the scene. This is the palace. It's not McDonald's. It's the palace. King David comes in, in his regalness, in his kingship, comes in and he sits right at the head of the table. His son Absalom comes in with his raven black hair down to his shoulders and all that goes with him. He comes in, he sits down. His beautiful daughter walks in and she sits down. And she's not in a two-piece. She's in royal stuff. And maybe at that dinner he's asked his lead guy of the army to come in and join him for dinner. This guy has got it together. He's one tough dude. He's in charge of the king's army, and he's sitting at the table. And then we hear, shh, kum, shh, kum, shh, kum. The crippled comes in and sits at the table, and he sits down, and the tablecloth 
covers his legs. And you never know that he's crippled. He is whole when he sits at the table. What a picture. We are whole when God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, calls us son. <laughs> when he calls us daughter. So what does it mean? What does it mean? It means that we, in our hopelessness, in our helplessness, in our enemy state, have an opportunity to have a relationship with God Almighty and to sit at his table and to be what he desires us to be. Or we have an opportunity if we are already there, but maybe we have pulled back because of something that may have happened to us or in our life. And maybe we've pulled back from the king's table. And we have an opportunity to come back to the king's table and to be what he desires us to be. Let me tell you, it's an exciting place to be at the king's table. <laughs> it's an exciting place to be at the king's table. He loves us that much that he calls us to be there. That's what it's all about. That's our story. We're not bringing anything to Jesus. He's bringing everything to us. I'm going to read just a few things because I think, Jim, are we running out of time? Did you get that call that somebody from at home? Okay. I'm going to obey my wife. Last night she told me don't read the whole list and I did it anyway but she highlighted some important points so I'm just going to give you the important ones. And these are things that we need to remember guys <clears throat> and I'll make it quick Jim. You have been adopted Romans 8 15. You have access to God at any moment Ephesians 2 18. You are beyond condemnation, Romans 8, 1. And babe, it's the last one. You are delivered from the power of evil, Colossians 1, 13. These things are important. They're important for us to know if we don't know Jesus, but they're important for us to know if we know Jesus. Because in that doubt, in that fear, in that temptation, in that habit, we need to know that these things are true. Amen? Amen. 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 We're going to take communion, have a little fellowship together with the cup and the bread. If you'd like to take communion, guys, this is really a neat time for you to shine because you can go up there and get communion for your wife and get points. If you want to take communion, come up and get them in the back, in the front. And then we'll have communion together. You know, it's interesting. Because of what Jesus did, I think we have recorded an invite to sit at his table all the way back in the Old Testament. So Jesus at a table with 
his guys that he, he was mentoring, that he was discipling, that he was teaching, <laughs> that the ministry was going to be left in their hands when he was gone. At that table, <clears throat> he took the bread and in a loaf then ripped it apart and he used the bread as a symbol and a story of what was going to happen in just a few hours to him. And with his guys and with us today, the body of Christ, we take the bread and Jesus said with his disciples, take eat. This is my body which is broken for you. At the same table a little later, he took the wine, took the cup, and he used it as an example. He told his guys <clears throat> that this is a picture. And he said, take, drink, this is my blood that will be shed for you. Drink together. Just briefly, I do not know where you are in your walk, but if you want to talk to somebody and share, or you want some prayer over some issues <clears throat> that are bothering you or in your life, or you want to pray for someone, please feel free to go to the prayer corner. If you want to talk to someone, we want to talk to you up here in the front. If you want to be baptized, if you're saying today's the day, can't get any hotter, I'm going to be <laughs> baptized, we, we want to do that as well. So let's stand together and we'll pray and we'll get out of here. God, I thank you for today. I thank you that you allowed us to be here in this place for this time for your word. And Father, I pray <clears throat> that it will impact us and that it will um, cause us to lean into you a little more, believe in who you are more, take that promise that you will never leave us or forsake us, and hunker into it, Father. Thank you. Thank you for this group in this place on this day, and we pray in your Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 Enjoy Sunday. Woo!